Okay, so for today's session, we are going to start to look at the regulation of blood glucose concentration because we are in this chapter called homeostasis. So the first part, we already look at kidney, right? Kidney as an organ of homeostasis, mainly osmoregulation and also excretion. So now in this second section, we will look at the regulation of blood glucose concentration. So I believe that uh, most of you have already learned uh, blood glucose regulation of blood glucose in the secondary school, right? Okay, so this will be a revision for you, plus a little bit extra only. So it'll be very easy today, okay? So uh, the learning outcome in the syllabus says that, 14.1.9, uh, describe the principles of cell signaling using the example of the control of blood glucose concentration by glucagon. So we know that all the hormone, right, are, are messenger molecules, and then they were attached to the receptor in the target cell, and then activate a series of reactions leading to the response by our target cell. So we're going to look at this one in detail today. And then number 10, explain the regulation of blood glucose concentration by the negative feedback control mechanism. Now take note of this, of this term, uh, negative feedback control mechanism means that the stimulus response model, it means the stimulus response model with the negative feedback because this is the principle for homeostasis. So when we want to regulate blood glucose condition, we use this method, means stimulus response model, which is called negative feedback control mechanism. You need to know this because when the question asks you, okay, uh, describe the negative feedback control mechanism, then you need to know what is it. Then you know what to describe, which is stimulus response model plus negative feedback, okay? Then effects of insulin on muscle cells and uh, liver cells. So we'll learn about glucagon as well as insulin, right? So putting everything together, I summarize it in the next slide that you're gonna, what you're gonna to learn today, effects of glucagon on liver cells. So in the next slide, what you're gonna to learn today is of course regulation of blood glucose concentration using insulin and glucagon in our body. And then of course, we'll learn a little bit more that this principle of cell signaling in the control of blood glucose concentration by glucagon. I think cell signaling is 2L, huh? okay, 2L here. Okay, please change in your notes. So before we start, um, let's talk about endocrine gland, which is not in syllabus, but because we are touching on hormones, so it's good to learn endocrine gland, okay? So what, what is endocrine gland? So you look at this picture on the right side, all the organs that are drawn there are endocrine gland, okay? So what is endocrine gland definition? Huh? Definition, it is a ductless gland, okay? Ductless gland means that when the cell, okay, the cell produce, so this is a cell with the nucleus, uh, produce and secrete the um, uh, hormone, it is secreted immediately to the surrounding. So this surrounding is the tissue fluid. So the uh, endocrine gland is a ductless gland. It secretes small quantity of hormone into the tissue fluid. And then from the tissue fluid, there be, you know that all cells are supplied with nutrients and oxygen uh, by the bloodstream, right? So there'll be capillary very close to it. So the hormone will then go into the bloodstream and then from the bloodstream, it will be carried to the target cells that are far away. So I'm going to draw these three lines to indicate very, very long distance. And then after that, it may go to the maybe target cell somewhere. Okay, and then the target cell has got receptor Okay, receptor for the hormone. So therefore, the hormone will bind to it and activate a series of reaction in the cell. Right, so this is target cell with the receptor. Okay, so uh, endocrine gland is called duct ductless gland because when the cell secrete the hormone, the cell does not secrete the hormone directly into the duct. Duct means a tube. Huh? Okay, duct means it's a tube. Okay. If, if you say, let's say you have learned about the um, mucus gland, right? You have learned about mucus gland in the trachea, remember? Trachea, other than goblet cell that secrete mucus, uh, mucus gland also secrete mucus, okay? So remember when, when we learned about the mucus gland, uh, hang on, ah, okay. So you see, we, we, we learned mucus gland like, like this, isn't it? So the wall of the mucus gland must be made up of cells, isn't it? 
just like the wall of the capillary is made out of cells, right? Nephron, the wall of the nephron is also made out of cells. So the entire tube, the wall is made out of cells, right? So here, the wall is also made out of cells, right? So I'm going to draw the cells here. So these are the cells that form the wall of the um, mucus gland, okay, mucus gland. So these are the cells that will be secreting the mucus, okay? So I only draw this side up. Huh? So the cell will secrete the mucus into the lumen and the mucus will go into the uh, lumen of the trachea, all right? So this, this tube here, right? This tube here is called the duct, you know? So this is called the duct, okay? D-U-C-T duct, okay? So when the cell secrete the mucus, the cell secrete it directly into the lumen of the duct. Okay, lumen. Okay, the empty space in the tube is always called the lumen. So I can call this lumen as well. Okay, this is lumen. So it's secreted directly into the lumen of the duct. So that's why it's called ducted gland versus the endocrine gland is ductless gland. Right, the cells secrete to the surroundings. Surrounding is what? Tissue fluid. Right, and tissue fluid then, from there, the hormone will go into the um, cap nearby capillary and then be transported in the bloodstream. So that's the difference between the ducted gland and ductless gland in our body. Okay, ducted glands are those that secrete mucus, your sweat, okay, your sweat gland, and then your, what else are enzymes in the digestive tract, right? These are all the ducted glands. Hormone is ductless gland. So that's why I show you here. So you've got a group of cells that will secrete the hormone. And then the hormone goes to the surrounding. From surrounding tissue fluid, it diffuses into the nearby capillary. So on the right side is actually a group of cells that form the eye, eyelid of Langerhans. Cancel off the S. Eyelid of Langerhans. Eyelid means one eyelid. Okay, look, later on I'll show you what is, when do you use the word S? Huh? So this one eyelid of Langerhans, Okay, you can see that the blood vessels, right? They are injected with dye so that you can see that the endocrine gland has got a lot of uh, a capillary in order to transport away the hormone that's secreted by the cell. So here you can see there's a lot of capillary, right? Okay, so that is the feature of endocrine gland versus the ducted gland. So ductless versus ducted, okay? So we're going to learn about pan, pan, islets of Langerhan, which is located in pancreas. So pancreas is a very flat, flat, long organ below our stomach. And it is very like elongated leaf shape. Okay. So it's on the left side of our, our duodenum. Okay. So you can see this blue color tube, right? It's actually the blood vessel. So it's written here, vein. Okay to the heart and the rest of the body. So this is blood vessel. So this is to show that this, this um, circle here, okay, this circle here represents the islet of Langerhans. So islet of Langerhans secrete the hormone and then hormone will diffuse into the tissue fluid and then go to this blood vessel, be transported to the body, okay? So blood vessel that transport the blood away from the, any organ in the body is the vein. So this is the vein. So it's blue color. Okay, usually artery, we use red color. Like vein, we use blue color because deoxygenated blood. So that's all for the location of pancreas and the islets of Langerhans. So this is a um, micrograph of the uh, pancreas, all right? Uh, just to show you the location of the islet of Langerhans, it's located here. Can you see this um, more, more lighter color stain structure, okay? The background is dark purple, right? This one is light purple. See, this one's light purple, this one light purple, okay? So all this light purple structure in the pancreas is called the islet of Langerhans. So that's why they call it islet of Langerhans because the word islet stands for island. Huh? Islet actually stands for, stands for island. So it's like the island in the sea of the the pancreas cell, right? It's like island. And this island got different sizes. Can you see? You get different sizes and different shape. So this is a structure of islet of Langerhans. So when do you use the word islets? 
uh, just now I, I told you, right, eyelet. You use the word eyelets when you are, uh, when I ask you to label, let's say, for example, okay, label this structure, uh, one and two. Uh, then you have to use eyelets. Okay, if I point to one only, then you use without the S. Let me do it again so it's clearer. Ah, this is this is one and two. It was my second one. Okay, one and two. Ah, yeah, one and two. So this is eyelet. Okay, one. So one and two is eyelets. One is eyelet. So eyelet of Langer hands. Okay, eyelet of of Langer hands. Eyelets of Langer hand. Langerhand must be capital L, okay? Because it's named after a scientist, so it must be capital L, okay? Uh, Langerhand's got S, eyelet of Langerhand's. Hang on, uh. So, eyelet of Langerhand's end with an S. There's an S there for Langerhand's, okay? So pay attention to the spelling when you study biology. It's very important. Eh? Okay, very, very important. Especially when you're asked to name your, your spelling wrong, no marks. Eh? Okay. So this is a higher magnification of the eyelets of Langer hands. Right, you can see very clearly this one is lighter color and this one as well. And you can see the nucleus of the cell. And this is the typical structure of the duct. All the duct in the body got similar structure. That means the cell surface membrane separating the cells in the duct are very, very clear, okay? And then it's um, usually the cells are very big cuboidal shape, okay? So again, this is an eyelet of Langerhans. You can see very clearly eyelet of Langerhans. And then this is the blood vessels because you can see the, the cells at the side are flattened and elongated nucleus. Can you see? Because all squamous cell. Squamous cell forms the wall of the capillary. So you can see that this flattened, elongated nucleus of squamous cell. Then the red color one are the red blood cells, huh? red blood cells in the capillary. Okay. This one is just now the diagram I show you where they inject the dye to show you location of the capillary. Okay, to show you the endocrine gland has a lot of capillary around it to transport away the hormone secreted by the cell into tissue fluid. Okay. So this is um, a drawing to show you the alpha and beta cell that secretes the hormone, okay? That secretes the hormone. So because they secrete the hormone, um, alpha cell, where's my alpha cell? They got name alpha cell or not? No, uh, they only said secretory cells, right? Alpha and beta cells. So got, got, you see? This one is numerous vesicles containing glucagon. That means this cell secrete glucagon. So what is the name of this cell? Alpha or beta? Huh? Alpha, beta? Zepat? Sufian? Very good. Alpha, correct? Okay, alpha, I put A because I cannot put a symbol. Okay, I just put A. So, so this is alpha, alpha cell. Is it called alpha cell? Yes, correct, alpha cell. And then on the left side, you see, it says here, numerous vesicle containing insulin. So that means this one, this cell secret insulin. So this is what cell? Uh, let me call Lim Yi Hao. Yes, what cell is this cell? Beta cell, right? Okay, so this is beta cell. So you can add in yourself. Huh? You use a symbol huh, for beta. I cannot use, when I type, I cannot use a symbol. So I put the B, okay? So beta cell. And you know that the insulin and glucagon, right? This hormone is protein. It's actually protein. So when a cell secretes protein, then you need to think of what are the organelles inside the cell. They have to produce a protein for secretion, right? So therefore, the cell will have got a lot of rough ER. Okay, you can see a lot of rough ER because the ribosome needs to produce the protein. And then there'll be a lot of uh, Golgi apparatus, okay, a center of... Uh, collection, modification, uh, transportation, and distribution, and then a lot of secretory vesicles. So this is a property of cell that secrete the 
uh, protein hormone. Okay. So you can roughly know the function of the cell by knowing what are the organelles inside the cell, isn't it? So when the cell got a lot of mitochondria, means the cell needs to produce a lot of ATP, right? To carry out certain processes that need ATP. So the organelle in the cell will tell you uh, uh, what kind of function they have to carry out. Lah. Okay. So now uh, we will move into learning about the regulation of blood glucose concentration. So it's a recap for you. So I have drawn this whole thing, okay, to summarize the uh, regulation of blood glucose concentration. Okay. So first, we'll look at the, the chart first. So this chart shows you the stimulus on the left side. So left side is a stimulus. Then this and the center blue color, shaded blue color region is receptor as well as control center. So in this case here, the receptor and control center are the same. They are the same in this case here only. Yeah? Okay. Then we've got transmission or coordination. Coordinate means you have to coordinate between one place of the body to the other. So it's called coordinate. By what transmission means you send the signal, right? Okay. Transmission means you send the signal. Then you've got the effector. Then effector carry out the response. The response leads to negative feedback. Okay. So we're going to look at the whole story now. So started with the normal blood glucose, normal blood glucose concentration about uh, 90 milligram per 100 cm cube. The average is 80 to 120. Okay, the normal level is 80 to 120 milligram per 100 cm cube. So stimulus is when there is a change from the set point. So when there's an increase in blood glucose concentration away from the set point, through dietary intake, that means this person eats something, right? With, with carbohydrate breakdown become glucose, okay? So it leads to increase in blood glucose concentration when the glucose is absorbed from the digestive tract into our bloodstream. So this leads to hyperglycemia, right? Hyper means uh, over, over means too much, okay? Hyper is a lot. Gly means glucose. Emia means your blood. So blood glucose is very high. What I mean by very high? Higher than set point. So this becomes stimulus. So who is the receptor? Receptor is the beta cells in the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. Okay, see how you describe beta cells and the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. Okay, so beta cell is the receptor as well as coordinator or control center. It will then secrete the hormone insulin, right? So coordination or transmission is by insulin. Then insulin will go to the effector, which are the target cells. So target cells in your syllabus is liver cell and muscle cell only. Okay? Actually, it's all cells in the body. So, but in your syllabus, it says liver cell and muscle cell. Okay? So what will, what will happen to effector? Okay? The liver cell and muscle cell, two main things will happen. As you can see, I labeled one and two, right? So the first thing is uh, we want the cell to take up the glucose from the bloodstream. So therefore, uh, the membrane of the cell, so there'll be increase in membrane permeability of the cell, the target cell to glucose and amino acid. Okay. So that will increase the glucose uptake from our blood. This one's not nice. So increase blood glucose uptake from the blood. So this is number one. Okay. So after the cell take in the glucose, it has to quickly convert the glucose to something else. Okay. So the rest of the process here are the processes that convert the glucose to something else. So number one, glycogenesis is the genesis means to synthesize, to produce. Glyco means glycogen. So we convert glucose to glycogen. Or respiration means we're going to oxidize glucose into CO2 and water. Or lipogenesis, genesis means synthesis of lipo means lipid. So you're going to convert glucose to fat. Okay. Or protein synthesis means going to convert glucose to protein. Okay. Of course, to convert glucose to protein, you remember it uses the respiratory pathway to synthesize all sorts of amino acid from Krebs cycle. From Krebs cycle, we can 
take out the metabolites and make amino acids. From amino acids, we make uh, uh, protein. We add amino acids together to make protein. Okay? So, these are all the processes that can remove the glucose to become something else in the cell. Okay? So, this will be, con this will be activated. But B are the processes that synthesize glucose. It will be inhibited because we, we have too much glucose already. So stop glucose synthesis. So what are the two processes that synthesize glucose? Is glycogenolysis. So glycogen lysis means the breakdown of glycogen or hydrolysis. So glycogen hydrolyzed to glucose is inhibited. So this dash line across this arrow means we inhibit this process. Okay, then gluconeogenesis gluco means glucose neo means new genesis means synthesis so we are synthesizing glucose from new uh, new materials which are non carbohydrate okay we are synthesizing glucose from a new uh, uh, substrate that is not uh, carbohydrate so for example we are using amino acid to convert to glucose. We are using glycerol to convert to glucose. We are using lactic acid to convert to glucose. So all these are called gluconeogenesis because we are starting from a non-carbohydrate substrate to make the carbohydrate glucose. Okay. So therefore, uh, these two glucose producing processes will be inhibited. Okay. So these are the um, reactions that will occur in our target cells. And because of this reaction, it will lead to a decrease in blood glucose concentration. So this is a negative feedback here. You see negative feedback with this arrow means uh, the response opposes the effect of the stimulus. Response will correct, will correct the... Um, the effect of the stimulus, okay, to make it bring the blood glucose back to the norm, right? So this is when blood glucose concentration increases. So let's see what happens when the blood glucose concentration drops. Uh oh. Okay. Right. So normal blood glucose concentration, there's a drop in blood glucose concentration because it's used by the body. So this drop away from the norm or the set point is called the stimulus, okay? So this is called hypoglycemia. Hypo means uh, lower, <clears throat> lower than normal, hypo, okay? Glucose in the blood, <clears throat> lower than the normal. So this is the stimulus. So what is the receptor and coordinator? The alpha cells, okay? So what about the alpha cells secrete glucagon for transmission? What is the target cell? Liver cell. Okay, because liver stores glycogen, right? So we want a lot of glucose, we want to break down the glycogen. So in the liver cell, it will activate a series of reactions, which we'll look into that in more detail later on. So I'll skip all these sentences first, okay? Because we'll look at this one in detail later on. So in liver cell, we want uh, glucose to be produced because your lack of glucose is low. So therefore, the two processes that, that can produce glucose in the body will be activated up. Huh? So glycogenolysis will be activated, okay? And gluconeogenesis will also be activated. And one more is uh, the use of fatty acid for respiration will also be activated. Because glucose is low in our body, right? You don't have glucose for respiration. So what else are you going to use? Alternative substrate, right? So what are alternative substrate you learn? Lipid and protein. So which one you use first? Lipid first or protein first? Lipid first, right? So your body will burn the fat first, right? After that, no more fat. Start to burn your muscle, isn't it? So we cannot burn the muscle first. We must burn the fat first. And then only not enough, no choice. Have to start to take, take your muscle, take the protein from the muscle. So you see the muscle start to shrink already. Uh, start to shrink already. Okay? After that, very thin, I can see the bone. Uh, that one is really malnutrition. Uh. Not enough food already. Okay? So because of these processes, it will, cause, uh, it will cause the blood glucose 
to rise again, right? So negative feedback, the response is there's increase in blood glucose concentration. So this is the response. Okay, negative feedback means a response that alter the effect of stimulus. So this is a complete um, control, negative feedback control mechanism. Okay, so this is a complete negative feedback control, control mechanism. Okay, it means a stimulus response model and a negative feedback. So now you know what you need to describe when they ask you, okay, describe the negative feedback control mechanism for when blood glucose concentration is high, seven marks. Can score full marks or not? Got many points to score full marks, right? Stimulus already one mark, right? A receptor already one mark, transmission one mark, okay? Then the response, you've got so many, so many reactions you can write in the, board, in, in the cell, isn't it? And then negative feedback, okay? So, definitely can score the seven marks. Okay, so next slide. So this is a micrograph of liver cell to show you that liver cell actually store a lot of uh, glycogen. So all these pink color granules, uh, you can see that almost the entire cytoplasm of the cell is filled with the pink granule because the function of this cell is to store glycogen. So that's why um, it's a lot of glycogen granules inside the liver cell. Right, you can see uh, this purple color is a nucleus, right? So the rest are cytoplasm, isn't it? It's all the cytoplasm filled with uh, um, the glycogen granules, right? This is stain pink. Whereas on the right side, uh, this is high power definitely in electron, micro, it's a, in electron microscope. So that's why it's black and white. All electron micrograph is black and white, okay? So it shows you these um, glycogen granules, the tiny little black color dots all over. And you can see a lot of mitochondria, the sausage shape, sausage shape, huh? organelle, can you see? All these are mitochondria. That means the cells are very highly active. That's why it need a lot of ATP to synthesize. You know, you convert glucose to glycogen, need ATP, right? It's an anabolic, re anabolic, anabolic, yeah. anabolic reaction, right? So that's why you need ATP. Okay, next. So putting everything together, the regulation of blood glucose concentration using the uh, negative feedback control mechanism to so use the stimulus response model. Okay, start with um, yes, high blood glucose concentration. So the receptor is the beta cells and alpha cells. Both are receptors. Huh? Beta cells and alpha cells in the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. Transmission to, because receptor and coordinator are the same. So you can see receptor coordinator are the same, okay? But the transmission is different. Huh? So now because you've got high blood glucose concentration, beta cell will secrete insulin, whereas alpha cells will stop secreting glucagon, okay? So transmission is by insulin in the bloodstream. Then the target cells are the liver cells and muscle cells. And the response is the blood glucose concentration will drop, bring back to norm. Okay. So what happened to the liver cell and muscle cells? Three main things. Number one, increase in membrane permeability to glucose. Number two, increase in glucose usage, means convert glucose to something else. And then number three, reduce in glucose synthesis. So it stopped the uh, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis, correct. Okay. So the next one is when the blood, there's low blood glucose concentration. So receptor is alpha and beta cells in the islands of Langerhans of pancreas. And the coordinator are also the same. Okay. So the alpha cells will now secrete glucagon, whereas beta cells will stop secreting insulin. So the transmission is by glucagon. The target cell is the liver cell. So response is there'll be increase in blood glucose concentration. So what happened to the liver cell? There'll be increase in glycogenolysis, lysis of glycogen, hydrolysis of glycogen into glucose, increase in gluconeogenesis, means synthesis of glucose from non-carbohydrate substrate, and then increase in lipolysis, means this breakdown of fat into fatty acid and glycerol for respiration because glucose is not enough. Okay? So I think these two uh, stimulus response model will be sufficient already for you to study this part. So therefore, the next one I want to skip because 
the more diagram you see, the more, the more confused you are. Correct or not? Two main diagram, clean and clear cut enough, right? So that one, you can cancel the whole thing. Okay? I see you, so I ping san already. Then after that, you say, teacher, so many diagram we want to learn. Uh. I say, oh, yeah, I also ping san. Okay, so we choose a clean, clear one to learn. So that one skip. You just read that for your own information. Okay, so in this section, we're going to look at cell signaling. Okay. <clears throat> so, going to look at cell signaling. Uh. In the control of blood glucose concentration, we will only look at one example of this. Whereas in the past year, in, in, in the previous syllabus, right, the student need to learn three different hormones. Cell signaling for three different hormones, but for you in this new syllabus, only one hormone. Isn't that nice? A lot of things removed already, yeah? Okay. So let's recap cell signaling from AS. Huh? So cell signaling is, uh, do I write 2L here? Yes, cell signaling is 2L, huh? okay? So it's getting a message or a signal from one place to another, okay, in our body. So what do you mean by one place to another? So it can be, for example, from the receptor to the control center or from the control center to the factor. So this is called from one place to another. So we send a signal, okay? So the part, so this cell signaling involves part of the transmission or the coordination in the stimulus response model. So it happens here, okay, during the transmission or coordination in the stimulus response model, right? So this is to coordinate cell activities in response to a stimulus in order to maintain uh, our body at a set point. Our body means our internal environment, more specifically, okay, more accurately, our internal environment at the set point. So uh, the cell signaling process that you're going to learn is uh, involving uh, glucagon. So let I summarize it into six steps. And then I will describe the six steps in detail. So we summarize the step first and then we go into the whole thing in detail, okay? So in a cell signaling process involving uh, glucagon, step number one is hormone receptor interaction. That means the hormone binds the receptor, okay? Hormone binds the receptor. So our hormone is the first messenger, right? First messenger, yeah. First messenger as well as primary messenger. So it will lead to conformational changes. Remember, Conformation means the structure of the protein, isn't it? When you say the structure of protein, conformation is the, the term that we use to describe the structure of the protein, conformation. Okay? So you know that globular protein, right? When something binds to globular protein, let's say, for example, uh, let's say this, this globular protein. Huh? Okay? So when something binds to the globular protein, it might change shape it might change shape, okay? It may change shape, eh? okay? Because it needs to hold. It needs to hold on to this, this um, molecule that sits into binding site. So this property is called allosteric property, right? Remember, allosteric property of enzyme, allosteric property. So it is this allosteric property of enzyme, uh, enzyme and also globular, globular protein, eh? that allows it to function, especially carrier protein, remember? How come carrier protein can carry a molecule from one side of the membrane to the other side? Because it can change shape, right? It can change shape, it holds something, and then it change shape. So this is called the allosteric property of the protein, globular protein. Huh? So this one must be globular protein. Huh? Only globular protein, because a fibrous protein cannot change shape. Huh? It's fibrous, it's solid already. Globular protein can change it, okay? So, therefore, when the hormone binds to receptor, it will lead to conformational changes, means change in shape. Lah. So, if you want to put more than due to allosteric property of globular protein. So, can you see that in this sentence, there are two keywords, allosteric and globular. So, when you, when you learn biology, you have to pay attention to the detail of the word that's being used to describe. Okay, it's not only protein, it's globular because it does not involve uh, um, fibrous. So there's something detailed that you need to pay attention when you study biology. If you want to score A and A star, 
If you do it like this, I guarantee you score A and A star. Okay. Number two, so after that activation of G protein, which will go and stimulate adenylyl cyclase. Number three, formation of cyclic AMP, in short, CAMP. So this is the second messenger or the secondary messenger. Then CAMP binds to protein kinase A, which is actually an enzyme because it's an ACE. Okay. Then activate enzyme cascade. Remember, this is a this is a biological term, enzyme cascade. It means it's a series of reaction that will produce the enzyme. Okay, so a series of reaction that produce an enzyme. So this is called enzyme cascade. So this one may be producing enzyme A. So this may be producing enzyme B. This one may produce enzyme C. So it's like, you know, waterfall, you pour the water, will water keep on flowing down, right? This one, you kickstart a reaction, then it keep on producing the product, product, product. In this case, enzyme. So enzyme cascade. Enzyme flow down. Clear enough. Enzyme flow down, right? But it's actually every time you flow down, it's a different enzyme, different enzyme, different enzyme. Because you activate the reaction to synthesize enzyme. So enzyme cascade is a key word. I see it many times in the mark scheme. Okay. So uh, enzyme cascade is to amplify the, amplify means magnify the signal. Then finally, the cell, cellular response will occur. So the final enzyme in the pathway catalyzes the breakdown of glycogen because we want to break down glycogen, right? So this is the response, okay? So this, I just outlined the steps. Now we're going to go to the steps in detail. Huh? So this is a step in detail. I use this diagram because this diagram got a lot of description. So you need to learn up the description. Then I'll use a simpler diagram to see the, the more detail, okay? So step number one, is the glucagon binds to the membrane receptor. So this glucagon will bind to the receptor of the target cell. So once it binds to the receptor, this receptor will change shape. So there'll be conformation, conformational changes. So when it change shape, it will cause this G protein. So this, is, this protein is called G protein. Huh? This G protein will start to move to the right side, and then it will bind to a nearby enzyme, which is called the Adenylyl cyclase. Adenylyl cyclase, or in another word, adenylate cyclase. So I put this in bracket because the mark scheme used this name. But these two names are same. It's the same. Huh? So in sometimes you read in internet or in other book, you may find the word adenylate, but your textbook uses adenylyl. So you follow the textbook. Okay. So this enzyme will be activated now. So this enzyme will catalyze the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP. Okay, cyclic AMP or in short, CAMP. CAMP. Okay, so CAMP is our secondary messenger. Whereas glucagon is our primary primary messenger, okay? So this secondary messenger will then bind to this inactive protein kinase enzyme. And this protein kinase enzyme will become active already. So when cyclic AMP binds to it, it becomes active protein kinase A enzyme. Did you see I put an A there? Because this name of the enzyme is protein kinase A. So I've added an A there. Okay, so once this is synthesized, it will kickstart the enzyme cascade reaction. Okay, so it will kickstart the enzyme cascade reaction, whereby a series of enzymes will be produced. So therefore, the first enzyme produced is actually protein kinase A enzyme. And that will lead to the next reaction that will produce active phosphorylase kinase enzyme. And then it will then activate another reaction to produce active glycogen phosphorylase enzyme. So these three enzyme name you need to remember. It's very easy. First one start with protein. So protein kinase. Okay, kinase is the name given to any enzyme that can uh, catalyze 
phosphorylation reaction. So kinase enzyme catalyzes phosphorylation reaction. Kinase enzyme catalyzes phosphorylation reactions. That means just phosphorylation can be Okay. So kinase enzyme catalyzes phosphorylation. So that means this kinase enzyme will catalyze the phosphorylation of this enzyme. So it becomes activated, correct? Okay. Now the next enzyme is you, you remove the protein. You remove the protein, you add another P. So another P is phosphorylase. So the second enzyme is phosphorylase kinase. Third enzyme, you remove the kinase, you retain the phosphorylase. So it becomes glycogen phosphorylase. This is the last enzyme. So the last enzyme will act on glycogen, so it's glycogen phosphorylase. Okay, so what will this enzyme do? Um, hang on. Huh? So this enzyme will catalyze the hydrolysis of glycogen. So you can see that glycogen okay, is being uh, converted to glucose by uh, hydrolysis. So you have to use the word hydrolysis. Hydrolysis. In the exam, if you cannot remember, then you can use converted to. Converted to. Okay. So how is the glycogen being hydrolyzed? We know that glycogen are highly branched, isn't it? Chain of carbohydrates. So I oh yeah, don't draw this. Draw straight. Which is a big curve on that. Okay. So let's say these are carbohydrate chains and they're highly branched, okay? Then we've got carbohydrate all branched. Okay, and another one here. Okay, so when hydrolysis occur, all the terminal glucose in the glycogen, all the terminal glucose in the carbohydrate chain, like this one is the terminal. Right? Terminal means the last one. Okay, all the last, uh, all the terminal glucose residues will be uh, removed from the carbohydrate chain. Okay, from the polysaccharide chain. So. This is how hydrolysis will occur. So a lot of glucose will be released at one time because the glycogen are branched. So there are a lot of terminal glucose, okay? Glycogen, can you see a lot of keyword I've mentioned? Glycogen is branched. So many terminal glucose. So many glucose molecule. Molecules released during hydro released per unit time during hydrolysis. So lear learning how to describe the process um, crystal clearly. Why is it efficient to store glucose uh, in branched polysaccharide chains? Because of this. Can you see that? At any one time, a lot of glucose can be removed when you need it. So this is efficiency. Okay, so I've described here in detail. Terminal glucose means the glucose in the at the end of all the carbohydrate chains. So terminal glucose residues are removed from many ends of glycogen branches. Okay, um, this one is not in your syllabus, so we can skip this. We don't want to learn a lot of extra details. Huh? Muscle, glucose use or respiration during exercise. This one we know, lah, okay? So this one we skip because you do not learn glut two, so we just skip the whole thing. Make it easy for you, can or not? Or you want to learn? Uh, those who want to learn, you can read yourself, uh, you can ask me. Okay, not in syllabus, I skip already. So make it easy. So this diagram, um, I put this diagram because it's easy to see what are the enzymes that you need to remember, correct or not? What are the name of the molecules that you need to remember? So you need to ignore epinephrine, epinephrine, uh, just take glucagon because you only learn glucagon, okay? So uh, whatever you don't learn, you just ignore. Lah. So glucagon bind to the receptor and then activate the G protein. G protein bind to adenylyl cyclase, adenylyl cyclase, and then causing CAMP to be produced from ATP. CAMP is a secondary messenger 
it will bind to protein kinase A to activate it. So when it's activated, protein kinase A will activate a series of enzyme cascade reaction. So starting from protein kinase A, uh, then the next enzyme that we activated is phosphorylase kinase. Then the third one is glycogen phosphorylase. So remember these three enzymes. So every step here you need to remember. Okay. So you learn in what, why is there enzyme cascade reaction? Is because the enzyme cascade reaction can magnify and in fact amplify the signal. Right? If one cyclic AMP here can activate seven protein kinase to be produced, I counted already about seven, two, four, six, seven. So one cyclic AMP can lead to seven protein kinase. So here you've got seven cyclic AMP can lead to 49, 49 protein kinase form, right? Then each protein kinase also can activate um, to produce uh, seven phosphorylase kinase. So you've got 49 phosphorylase kinase here, right? You've got 49. Each one can cause seven enzy active enzymes to be produced. So you've got 49. How many active enzymes produced? 49 times 7, right? 7 times 49 is how much? 29 something. 3, 4, 3. So initially, you start with 7 here, right? Then you end up with 49 here, right? Then the next step, you end with 3, 4, 3. So you can see that the signal is being magnified. Every time you cascade down, there are more and more molecules produced. So eventually, you've got a lot of the glycogen phosphorylase enzyme produced. So the more enzyme, the higher the rate of reaction, right? Uh, that's why you want to synthesize more enzyme. So that will lead to higher rate of reaction. So a lot of glucose can be released for us to use when we are low in glucose concentration. So can you see that our body is very amazing? All these little, little things happening, like every day happening in your body, and you don't have to control it. It's given us. So it's given us, we are very blessed, isn't it? Okay, so it's, we are very blessed. So always remember that, okay, to live is a gift. Okay, to live is a gift, right? Body is given you, okay? Then the food is given you, the sunlight is given you, right? Okay. Now, if got time, I'll show you this video. If no time, I'll not show you, okay? I think I will not show you because no time. So you play the video on your own, huh? So the last part is the, our blood glucose concentration will always fluctuate in our body. Even though there's homeostasis, it will always oscillate up and down, up and down, okay? So insulin and glucagon work together to regulate our blood glucose concentration. However, our blood glucose concentration will never remain constant. You cannot see uh, a person's body, right? If I draw the graph, okay? So this concentration versus time. We cannot see that glucose concentration is a straight one. Huh? Is it because my body got homeostasis, right? I expect my glucose concentration to be straight. Never. Always go up and down, right? Okay. So reason, because there's always a time delay for our body to respond to a change of the blood glucose concentration. Okay. So I will show you in a graph, explain what does it mean, huh? So see, uh, okay, this is how our blood glucose concentration looks like in the graph. It will always go up and down. This is called oscillation. Uh. Oscillation means go up and down, uh, fluctuation. Why? Because of a delay in our body response. Let's say, for example, you take a meal here. Okay. Then after you take a meal, after digestion, which is the next class. After digestion, then um, our body will start to absorb the glucose and goes into the blood. So this blood, right? So you start to increase as we absorb more and more blood glucose. So therefore, increase slowly. Okay, increase slowly. And then when it increases, we're supposed to actually bring it back to norm. But how come it takes so long eh, before we can reduce the blood glucose? Because during this time frame, then you must tell me what happened. During this time frame, it's very easy, one, eh, this part here. You think of the stimulus response model. First, you start with, there's an increase, right? So there's a stimulus, there's an increase in a blood glucose concentration, okay, increases. So then until the point where 
our body uh, reduces the blood glucose concentration. Okay, what happened over here? Um, so what happens over here? You need to actually explain. Uh, until we are able to reduce the blood glucose. So all this process starting from here to here, right? Okay, from here to here, it needs time. Right, the stimulus response model needs time, right? Before the response can be carried out. Reducing blood glucose is a response, you know. So this is the response. So there's a time in between the stimulus and response. That's why there's a delay in the response, right? So you must tell me what happens during this timing. That means you must tell me your stimulus response model. So after the stimulus, the stimulus needs to be detected by receptor. So what is the receptor? Then the receptor will need to send signal to its transmission. Right? After transmission, you've got coordinate, coordinator. So in this case, it's the same right? for glucose, coordinator. All right? Then coordinator inside the we have to <clears throat> send the message to our um, effector. And then inside the effector, you see the self signaling process, so many steps, right? So all these processes need time before we can produce a glycogen phosphorylase that will catalyze hydrolysis of glycogen to glucose, then only glucose release then only increase in, hang on, sorry, did I say something wrong? <laughs> okay, insulin release, right? Okay, and then after that, our target cells will increase permeability to glucose and then increase in um, uptake of glucose and convert, conversion of glucose to something else. That only blood glucose concentration drop, right? So that's why there's a time delay from the beginning where there's a stimulus until the end where there's response there are a lot of processes that happen that requires time. So that's why there's a delay. So that's why you've got no choice but to allow the blood glucose to continue to increase before we can actually have the response to start to reduce it back. Can you see that? And then when it restores to norm, right? It doesn't stop there. It continues to go down. Again, because there's a delay in response again. A delay in our, yeah, delay in the response. So it keep on going up and down, up and down, up and down. Okay, because it's a time delay for our body to respond to the stimulus in order to produce the response. Okay, so are you able to get full marks if you've got this kind of question come on exam? Very easy, isn't it? Just remember stimulus response model. Right, what happened in between the stimulus and response? That's why there's a delay, a time delay. Okay, crystal clear? Right. Okay, so this one, please ignore the whole thing or else after confused. No need to see. Too much thing reading. Yeah, I give you that one enough. So this sample question, you can read and try it out yourself. Okay, and this is the answer. So you can pause my video to look at the answer. You need to talk about stimulus response model in regulating blood glucose concentration. So that's all for today. Okay, so today you have looked at the regulation of blood glucose concentration using insulin and glucagon. And the principle of self signaling the control of blood glucose concentration by glucose. All right, so that's all for today. Thank you, everyone.